My name is Mike Hollicher. I'm a co-organizer of New York Dam Meetup, uh, or Digital Asset. What do we call it these days? NYC Dam. NYC Dam Meetup. Let's just call it NYC Dam Meetup for now. Um, yeah, that thing. Um, so what we're talking about tonight is we're talking about uh, we're talking about blogging about dam, and we have two very uh, very respected people in both dam and blogging um, who have credible, really good to read blogs. Um, over farthest to my right is Phil Spiegel, who blogs at Dam Ideas, and I have Henrik Dior, who blogs at another damn blog, which gives you an idea that there are many damn blogs out there. Um, there are a few. So um, I guess the first question with this is, uh, is what first moved you to blog about dam? Um, what, what got you to the, to the point where you and your career working in dam made you want to sort of discuss it in a, in a different, in a in a in a different medium that that is a little bit more uh, in a in a public sphere. Um, for me, it's a bit personal in that I, I did I started like 2008 or so, and um, I was just frustrated and had a lot of ideas going in my head and just didn't have a forum for sharing them and thought this would be a good place for me to sort of therapeutically sit down and you know, gather my wits and, and just document some of the things that are on my head. And I actually um, found it really painful at first and uh, much harder than I thought. I thought after a buddy of mine had convinced me I should do it, that it would just be easy. I'd go home and set it up and start banging away. I had all these ideas. It would be easy. And it actually was uh, really hard and really painful at first. Um, and I equated it to um, getting in the middle of Grand Central Station and putting an apple cart down and dropping your pants to your ankles and starting to talk. It was really hard to do at first. Um, but you know, you sort of find your voice and you start to get your rhythm and, and it all flows. Um, for me, it was about sort of thinking, you know, just having a place to centralize my, my thoughts and to you know, start sharing information and, and sort of not have to have a place to point to when asked repeatedly about a lot of the same things. I can say, well, here's the answer, here's a short answer, but if you want more information, you, I've talked about this on post XYZ, here's the web, here's the web link. And, Give me a call if you want to talk further about it. So you were frustrated too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 2008 was a rough year for, uh, I think, for a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. especially in Washington. So. Right, right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're both actually from the D.C. area originally. Um, and uh, I actually, when I was started in DAM, I was looking for information in the user and administrator perspective and found none. So I was also frustrated, and I had lots of questions, and uh, I wanted to figure it out so, and share it, because if I learn it, why not share it so that people can learn from my mistakes, my uh, enlightenments, uh, the, my successes, uh, etc. So it took a while, um, but I literally started another damn blog and wrote a post about... Um, what was wrong with dam in the first place and why would I need a dam and, and that was my first post and I got an unbelievable strong response from the dam community which I didn't even know existed honestly um, that a lot of people felt the same frustration about the exact same thing as I did so I started blogging about it and I kept blogging about it and I connected with more and more people through conferences and meetups uh, and other events and connected with people one-on-one -on -one because they had the same issues and they were facing the exact same issues no matter what industry they were in about digital asset management. So I shared about those things, uh, protecting the names of the innocents and the guilty, and then uh, kept writing. And so now I've amassed 170 blog posts um, after four years um, and still blogging. Um, so uh, frustration was the main mm -hmm. driver. Yes. So yeah, it, 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 it starts with pain. Yes. It starts pain. with having to share the having pain. to relieve the pain, <laughs> then share the relief. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and get to a point where things are better. I, you know, you, you mentioned uh, protecting the names of the innocent. Um, both of you are, are sort of like 
kind of in the consulting world right now, but I know you've also worked in in organizations, um, you know, as as an employee. So it's so is is there how is how does it work for you in terms of in in terms of that honesty, you know, and also with that anger? Um, how you know what are the sort what are the sort of processes that you go through in order to keep from uh, really going too far you know if, if, you know if you have you ever deleted a post because it was just it was just too vituperative you know just too angry or something like that no <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that. <laughs> no I, I i filter uh mm-hmm. for obvious reasons mm-hmm. uh because when you get frustrated you say mm-hmm. certain things you don't want to say publicly mm-hmm. but, um but then you filter and make it readable for pg audiences um but you state what you want to say, and uh, that's the blogging platform is to, to state what you want to say mm-hmm. and share the ideas that you you have, and communicate that, um, and communicate the the ideas that you and the things that you've learned from others. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, whether it's from the innocence or from the very very guilty that uh, mm-hmm. should know better. Uh, so you you share that and you tell them so why do you have 50 dams Mm -hmm. and what is your problem Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, why aren't you consolidating that Uh, and you don't really have an excuse do you but um, but yeah there's plenty of other things Mm -hmm. and then you it it can also become a uh, a forum for calls to action like Mm -hmm. asking for a dam glossary which has recently started and asking for a matrix of all the integrators and implementers of digital asset management Mm -hmm. along with all the vendors that match up so that that was my latest call to action for that Mm -hmm. things like that um yeah i mean i never you know you want to be careful not to not to say anything that would be it's a very public environment so if you put it out there you're owning it you can maybe delete it the next day but it's already too late so you do want to be, um, you know, careful and, and smart, and not um, don't blog angry. Don't hit publish now. You can always sort of leave it in preview for the day or two and percolate on it. Um, and that's I I, I have to say I, I don't think I've ever been angry when I've written one, but I I have been fired up where I've thought I need to be clear that I'm taking a stand. I need to make sure that I'm not sort of wishy-washy about what I'm advocating, I can't qualify it in any way. If I'm gonna make an assertion, I really have to make that assertion 100% and I have to make it clear. Um, so I, and just my process is, um, you know, I'll usually write them, I'll let them sit in preview and sort of come back the next morning or the next day and think about it and see if I'm still happy with it. And if I am, publish, and I never look back. It's done, I'm not going back and editing it. If I get 20 comments from people saying you're a knucklehead, I'm a knucklehead. If I get 20 from people say that was really great, then great. But you know, they're they're done, and they're, I'm on to the next one. Well, that that's an that's sort of an interesting thing to think about. I mean, I mean, you have the, you know, you always have to stake a point. But have you ever have you ever, you know, just taken a point just to play devil's advocate, just to just to sort of put an idea out there, even if you don't necessarily 100% believe it. And and if if you ha- you know what are your thoughts around that? Do you think that's that's a disingenuous way of doing of doing things, or do you feel like just simply putting an idea out that is that 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 is potentially a hot button issue is is worth it? You know, not not necessarily from the standpoint of clickbait. You know, where you're just saying something that's just just completely wrongheaded and obnoxious. Um, I use that on occasion where I actually state the opposite of what logic is because sometimes people think that way um, where they actually do the illogical thing so I Mm -hmm. state that and I actually use it in italics on purpose Mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't make any sense so I want to make sure I iterate that instead of stating that oh this is a fact see uh, uh, you should have 50 dams and Mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't have any metadata uh, and other absurdities um, because that's the way to failure and that's what you want for some reason because you like spending money and that's the fixed idea you know I yeah. mean it's like one thing you run into a lot in, in when you're when you're dealing with these integrations is that people come to you with very fixed ideas that they that 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 
they've created and they believe in mm -hmm. and you have to you know the it, it's it's not a logical thing it's an emotional thing you know and then one of the key aspects is that is that people will will people will kill themselves with their with the processes that they created because it's theirs mm -hmm. True. So, so that's one of the things that I guess you know you're trying to trying to pull out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is true. I mean, a lot of people are, act emotionally instead of logically, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I iterate that. Even though I don't blog emotionally for mm -hmm. the most part, um, uh, I can't say that it's all factual. It's more experience than anything else. Whether it's my experience or experience that I'm sharing from another person that I've gotten this information mm -hmm. from, I get some a lot from. Uh, readers uh, and people who email to me saying I have this problem like my uh, vendor doesn't list me mm -hmm. uh, how do I make this so it's happen kind of dear Abby kind yeah. of yeah. 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 that might be a good angle there <laughs> Sometimes. well I'm not dear Abby for sure I, mean, <laughs> I like to think of, of mine as like little op-ed pieces I'm trying to make an essay I'm trying to be kind of funny in, in it and, and make the point there's, the facts issue is, is interesting because you're not really sharing facts. Um, lots of times you can't share facts, um, mm -hmm. but you're sharing uh, experience and you're, you're sharing experience concepts and offering some sort of general guidance. Um, you know, and just to go back to your point about mm -hmm. controversial, I can think of one instance where I purposely took a position on something that was a little more sort of edgy, and, and, and I should preface that um, a lot of what I write is about them, and it's also about the media archive community and archives in general, so, and the archiving pro process. And I, I can think of one instance where I, I, knew, I knew I was writing something that was gonna ignite a little debate, and I, but I felt like I had had the same conversation a number of times in that week or so, <clears throat> a week or so up to it, and it was really just in my head, and I kept thinking, you know, I can't be the only one sort of struggling with this, and, and I'm not, so why not see what the general response was? And the response was interesting. You know, a lot of people were like, you're, you know, you're the devil. You would never do that. I mean, that's just crazy. <laughs> and others were like, I'm so glad that, um, you know, you put that out there and that, <clears throat> you know, it's at least being debated and we're not the only one struggling with that, that issue. Um, but, but otherwise, it's really, it's about just sort of sharing experience and, and just sort of, you know, sharing you know broad concepts at least for me it is that that kind of makes me think of the conversation that i had right before this and the conversation i think i've had with all of you and pretty much everybody in this room of like is I, one of the one of the more interesting things of of being in this space is that is that you know i can i can talk about a deployment i did and you can talk a deployment talk about a deployment that you did and he can talk about something and you know there are, very rarely do do they meet you know Re very rarely do the experiences totally match up you know and and some and the rules are not always applicable to the, from one job or to the next one How, th do you feel like there's some tension there in terms of like what you're trying to when you're trying to present uh, thoughts, or do you really just have to keep it at a, at a broader level? Uh, how far in the weeds can you get? Uh, you know, I, I think it really depends on the topic and this, uh, the particular point that you're trying to make. Um, it's really hard to be too specific. Um, if, in a previous life, when I was an employee of a company, I could be a little more specific without being too vague and without sort of sharing too much information. Um, a lot of it was industry known, but you know, as a consultant, you really you're. I'm bound by tons of you know, NDAs left and right, so I'm 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 just trying to be really careful about not inadvertently saying something that I shouldn't be saying. Um, but again, I don't think it necessarily matters. I think you can still make your point, and I think you could still talk about a process in the abstract, and still have value in that in that exercise. I don't think you need to get into the weeds to be effective, and I think to some degree. Your weeds are going to be different than his weeds, and his weeds are going to be different than her weed. So there might be sort of best practice guidelines, but the particulars are going to be different in any instance anyway. Yeah, and I keep it at a basic level for the most part. I'll occasionally go really technical. Uh, you know, if I'm talking about algorithms to deduplicate or something super technical, uh, which most people don't understand, and then other people, like engineers, look at this and like, oh, 
wow, you talked about it. Wow, cool. Um, but then the rest of the people will have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so it's, it's really talking at starting at a base level and building it up uh, so that you have, you give some understanding and some context to, to the audience, no matter who they are. Cause uh, I'm talking directly to the damn community, whoever they are. Uh, and uh, it's going to have a variety of experience levels uh, across the board. So, um. so now I'm going to get controversial. <laughs> Vendors and conferences. Mm. How do you deal with them? How do you deal with them? I mean, I mean, one of the things with the world that you know, the world that we're in, is that if you're if you are a public face. You know, if you're putting if you're putting your thoughts out there, um, the topic comes up of vendors. Some have do vendors approach you? Do vendors do vendors come to you and and ask, hey, you know, could you give me a plug? You know, do they do they ask for interviews? How do they work with you? The same goes for conferences. I mean, conferences are also sort of a thing where, like, I mean, uh, you know, the the, the conferences have changed as much of the industry has um and and they're always struggling to to kind of get the best knowledge out there you know i mean i mean what's your relationship with them as well well let's start with vendors so everyone who's read my blog and know enough about me know that i'm vendor neutral i'm vehemently vendor neutral uh because there's over 177 damn vendors out there and i don't favor any of them I don't necessarily like most of them, but that's another issue. <laughs> um, uh, they all have their challenges and they all have their pros and cons and everything else. Um, but you have to you pick one uh, unless you build your own magical system uh, from with magic wands and toothpicks. Um, but uh, usually those don't fly very well nor last very long because they don't scale for the most part. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, the... Uh, the, the way I deal with vendors is yes, I get called by them on a regular basis, and they do ask me to do various things like, mm -hmm. oh, will you do a podcast with us? Can we interview you? Can we do blah, blah, blah. And I was like, uh, so no, because it's going to be branded with your information. It's going to be branded with your logo, and I am vendor neutral. I'm still vendor neutral. So the answer is still no. So uh, when I did my book thing, several of the um, 64 backers were damn vendors. Mm -hmm. And that's fine because they were amongst the crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not like one vendor was sub submitting more money than the other or whatever. Uh, there was no quid pro quo? No, there was not. No. <laughs> uh, not that I would think that you would ever go for no, that. No, 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 no. They, they did ask, of okay. course. Oh, they were okay. like, oh. That's, that's what I wanted to Yes, know. they did ask, and, and the answer was still no. <laughs> um, and I won't name the vendors because that would be a plug. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I'm vendor neutral, and I stay that way uh, because it benefits all of you as the damn community. So I don't talk about one or three or five vendors because mm -hmm. then I lock myself into those only. Uh, which doesn't benefit the general damn community. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I actually am less interested in the vendor conversation as a topic. I, I don't think it really matters. I think that <clears throat> you know it's not the right place to be advocating or, or speaking of any particular vendor or, or product. Um, I, I think it's far more interesting to talk about the problem and to talk about the workflow and the process and to ask questions about are, are you trying to solve the right thing? Are you, are, you, are you sure you know what you're doing? Are you thinking about this in the way that really makes the most sense, um, irregardless of the technology you choose? Because that's going to help drive a good decision. Um, so I, I don't necessarily cross that path. But I do, um, with conferences I have, um, I will post that I'm going to be at a conference. I didn't do it for this one, unfortunately. Um, and occasionally I've gotten uh, an email from one of the conferences asking if I could post a discount code, and I've done that. Um, and occasionally they've asked if I would just post that it's an event that's happening, which I would do anyway. Um, but I don't feel like that's necessarily a, a cross of the line. Yeah. And then, we, we do that too, just yeah. full disclosure. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. And, and sort of in the same way that you guys have your page set up, you know, I have news panels and events and stuff on the sides, and I sort of use that as my forum. So I'm not necessarily 
advocating anything in either of those places. I'm just aggregating it. Um, you know, I, I only take editorial responsibility for the blurbs, uh, you know, for the actual posts. And that sort of helps me keep the lines clean. Do you do you guys both read industry some of the some of the vendor blogs because they're actually you know I won't name names either but there's some really good ones out there and it's you know I, I feel like it's kind of good that you know they stay on their side and you guys stay on your side but it's like uh, I imagine you guys are you know I won't have you name names too but you're both up, you know find them useful uh, yeah absolutely I mean you you can get <clears throat> you can get an enormous amount of free information into your email box every day. Um, you know, I'm happy to dedicate a few minutes to read um, anything that's sent to me that might be relevant. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to turn around and endorse it. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. just it's just facts. It's just add it to the library and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I I add a lot of the blogs that are vendor neutral um, or not specific about any specific any specific uh, damn vendor uh on my blog roll so i actually post some of the other blogs uh, such as damn ideas and others um and others that are in the room here that are blogging uh who will remain nameless uh but uh i'm happy to share the other thoughts about those people who are contributing to the damn community because it's literally all about sharing that information and sharing the knowledge because if you're not doing that then why are you blogging mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess one of the other questions is, is, I mean, you've been blogging since 2008. You've been blogging since 2008 as well? I, I've already forgotten. Yeah, Roughly around the same time. So, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, that as you noted, that was, a, that was sort of a, a kind of a watershed moment because it's like the, the whole industry itself seemed to, seemed to be like kind of capsizing and then it right-sided right -side itself and is kind of... And, going in a pretty good clip lately. But I'm wondering if what your thoughts are around like the state of damn blogging. I mean, are there a lot, not necessarily with the, you know, the, the industry ones don't really, you know, the vendor ones don't count. Um, Cause you know, that's the, it's, it's different. But um, for the, for the independent ones, I mean, do you see, are you seeing new better bloggers coming out or are you, you just kind of seeing it going at the same rate, you know? Are you seeing good topics? Are you seeing people who are who are asking good questions? Yeah, I actually contribute to several other uh, um, forums like CMS Wire mm -hmm. and uh, Dam Coalition and mm -hmm. the Dam Foundation on occasion. Uh, they are all having other bloggers on them, which is a nice forum aside from just talking in a monologue sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I welcome that, and mm -hmm. it's it's all it's all there. I, I mean, I I don't uh, I don't mind it at all. I think it's it's great. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, and I I probably have spent less time on those than I should, but um, I I would say thematically, it seems like they're breaking into more specialties. That's the thing I've noticed in the last year or two. Um, but again, I'm happy to share as well. I, I don't really have a, you know, I think the more the merrier. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you don't ever know where you're going to get some new piece of information that was the piece you were really looking for. So if, if there's, you know, 50 other new ones, great. You know, it's, for me, it's about time. I just, there's just not enough hours in the day to focus on this. And uh, that's the hardest part sometimes. Time is the enemy. Hmm. So what do you think the hardest thing to talk about is? With with damn <laughs> Phil, the hardest thing to talk, the hardest the, thing to the talk hardest, about. You know, how to how to, you know what's the hardest thing to sort of extrapolate? You know, and just sort of explain what you're doing and get across. You feel you get across. I think I think there's a couple of things I could think of, quick. You know, sort of that come to mind associated to the word hard. I think hard is hard is finding your voice and getting getting some momentum going to where you can do it. Hard is perhaps having to you know, sort of extract details out of something that you wrote a very long detailed article about so that it, it doesn't cross any lines. And hard for me is just finding um, enough hours in the day to do it. I, as some of you who maybe check it out once in a while, I don't, I'm not nearly as active as I had been only because there's just, I'm just too busy with other things and that's, that's really hard. Um, in terms of topics, if I'm really fired up, 
man, I'll write it on the train. Uh, you know, it'll just be on my phone. I'll just get it off my head. Um, it, it's, it's really not, there's no one topic I can think of that um, I find prohibitive. Um, yeah, it's the process that's hard. Mm -hmm. I agree that it, it, the process is the hardest part. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I struggle with. I mean, writing a post is easy. It's editing that I find difficult because mm -hmm. I want to add or subtract lots from it. Mm -hmm. And so it'll take me probably three times longer to edit it uh, than to write it. Uh, and some of my yeah. posts will be like 2,000 words long, yeah. uh, which is supposedly really long for a blog post. Writing know. is rewriting. Yes, I'll, and re, re, re rewriting. <laughs> just, yes. Please. Just, just to add to that, you know, I, I've got um, a slop sheet of ideas and half written posts and buzz lines or vendor names. And I, you know, I often go back and recycle something, not recycle it, but we'll go back to something I might have written in a paragraph in a huff six months ago that I thought was important, but I just didn't know where it went or it didn't have any relevance until some other event. And then it suddenly was like, aha, now I can connect that to this other thought and I have something new to talk about or something better than wherever I left off on that previous one. So. It's a lot of throwing pieces in the air and stitching them together later. You too? <laughs> yeah, I have 100 unwritten blog posts mm -hmm. sitting in my queue. Yeah. So, yeah, same thing. So, so the whole sort of thing, one of the, I think, the big reasons, one of the great things about blogs is blogs are really meant to be a, a jumping off point, a starting off point for further conversations. And I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is what, are, what are people not talking about in DAM that, that they should be talking about? Whether, whether you've brought it up, whether you guys have brought it up, or, or you haven't yet. What are the things that, what, you know, are there, are, you know, and that kind of leads to like, are there things that you, you know, that you're trying to express now that you haven't gotten to without selling, you know, selling out new blog posts or anything? Uh, I'm happy to give a prequel to them. Um, so uh, I've had multiple conversations about this with m numerous individuals, and that's how I start that thought process. Um, and it's, it's really about transparency in the market. Uh, so where's the pricing? Mm -hmm. Where's uh, how much is it really going to cost me? Yeah. Uh, how, what is it really going to do for me? Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, uh, and the transparency is not 100% clear, to put it nicely. Uh, so that's something I'm pushing for, and it starts with uh, using this own vocabulary. So I'm pushing now for uh, damn glossary, and uh, luckily that was listened to. I wrote a post in February, uh, and someone literally created uh, this week uh, damnglossary.org. Uh, where you can literally contribute words that don't exist in the vocabulary of English, um, but <laughs> vendors use these words, and so do integrators and implementers. Uh, so is it sort of a wiki <laughs> format? Uh, kind of. More like online dictionary, I think. Um, so it's missing a bunch of words, and now you can contribute this uh, unknown vocabulary from many, many vendors. So using the same vocabulary as everyone else so that you understand what they're talking about when they're using f super fluffy words that don't mean anything to anyone else um, and you can't find it in the dictionary or Wikipedia or Urban Dictionary or anything else. Um, so yeah, that there's, there's plenty to blog about uh, and that aren't being talked about enough or at all. The, well, well, to that I'll, I'll let you answer that, but, but just to, to follow up too, I mean, I, mean, I mean, do you feel like people, there are other, topic, other topics beyond there? that maybe people misunderstand that, that, that should be spoken about differently. Yeah, there's plenty of in dam that's misunderstood, and so there's yeah. plenty to write about. <laughs> that's we're, not we're a problem. Come back to that. Please. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I, think, I think for me it's about sort of getting, you know, changing the time. There's two things that, that I think of with this point. One is um, getting people to stop talking about the conversation the wrong way, you know. And again, I'm, I'm biased in that for me, it's a, it's a puzzle, it's a process. I think of it as that. I've got a big pile and I need to make, bring order to it. Um, and so I, I get really disinterested when the conversation starts with, I've got system X, what do you have? Yeah. 
that's a total, like, I don't even want to talk anymore. I, just, like, I don't care. Um, so that, that's always frustrating, and I feel like I see more and more of those lately, and that's a bummer. But, but I think for me, I'm really sort of, I've been percolating on the thought that sort of what's next? I mean, I think, Michael, you made a good point that 2008 was sort of a watershed and, and that the boat was really palpably sort of going under and, 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 and the economy was in turmoil and there was a lot of sort of uh, question marks. And, and I feel like now we've sort of been sailing along and now I'm, I'm sort of like, well, where's this all connecting to? What's mm -hmm. the next paradigm shift that's gonna come from this? And is it transparency? Is it more standards? Is it more interoperability? Is it some new amazing thing that's gonna blow all of our socks off? I, I don't know, but that's a lot of what I've been thinking about in the last few months mm -hmm. that I haven't written about yet, but I'm yeah. working on it. I got a lot of notes. <laughs> that's that's going to be a question later, actually, <laughs> or maybe even now. I mean, I mean, I guess that's sort of the thing. I mean, it's like it's like, you know, the, there's always there's always been a lot of complaints on quite a few blogs about how this this space, this industry, has always sort of been sort of been like you know, in a point where it's all about the blow up it's all about to be you know it's all about to be much bigger and much much better you know and it just seems we've always been stuck in that sort of second gear for as long as i've been doing this and as long as you guys have been doing this um so i i, I guess what i'm wondering is exactly what you said i mean i mean what is what do you see as as the new what are going to be the hot topics 2014, 2015, 2016. You know, what are the things that are gonna that that are, that that you think you're gonna be blogging about? Yeah, I, I already said it all now. I don't really know. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering about the same thing as well, and and I'm not sure. You know, I, again, I, I maybe I'm a little different in that. Um, you know, I'm sort of straddling the archive, physical world, and physical asset world, along with that transition to digital, and then the technology and support on that side. And so for me, the the issue is about you know, hurrying up and getting as much that's in jeopardy digitized and organized. Um, and then being able to find it and maximize the ability to find it and make it valuable. <clears throat> and increase its transparency throughout the organization or throughout your global network or whatever. Um, so the urgency in my head is always sort of starting with someone's got a Umatic somewhere that was shot in 1978 mm -hmm. and they're fooling themselves that they think they're gonna be able to easily digitize that tomorrow or five years mm -hmm. from now and how do we you know uh, how does anyone sort of spark that you can't wait a whole lot longer the decisions are being made for you by mm -hmm. by not doing anything um but in terms of like that ma'am damn space I, I don't know I, I really am sort of caught on i don't know what that i hate to be only a buzzkill but i don't know what um is next but I, i'm sort of thinking that there's going to be something new something that's going to come together and it seems like the, the time is ripe, and it seems like there's something in the air. And I, I well, there's the, you know, there, there's if if we're constantly talking about the same issue, you know, the same issues over and over again, and one of the same issues that we'll always be talking about, which which is technology technology resistant or people, um, maybe you know, maybe that's sort of a sign of maturity. You know? Maybe. A good point. You know, if you're if 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 you're if you're not constantly tripping over tripping over you know new stumps in the ground and and falling and trying to figure out, or trying to figure out a way out of the forest or something like that, maybe you've gotten to a point where you're just sort of solving the problems. You know. Yeah, I think it's actually a really good point. I mean, I think you know we're not in the we're out of the the, the woods with regard to a lot of the technology issues and a lot of the throughput and bandwidth issues. It isn't about it doesn't work at all. It's about it doesn't work as well as I'd like it to work, or it doesn't work to the extent that I need or, it to work for some new business or some new uh, product that I didn't know about three years ago. The questions I think now are like, are are is it going to work if I attach it to this? Yeah. Or or is it going to work if 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 we try and do something differently? Those are those are those seem to be the larger, the larger things that are coming down, and then just the sort of scale issues of, of space, you know, like like disk space, uh, bandwidth, you know, uh, WAN stuff, all that sort of fun, all that, you know, workflow, right. things like that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really good point. Yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be plenty to talk about whether it's people, process, technology, or information. And mm -hmm. we talk way too much about technology, even though it's 
uh, supposedly 20% of the problem, mm -hmm. uh, and the other 80% is the other three. Um, and people are maturing to a degree, depending on how long they've been in the field. If, uh, but they're, the new people in the field are still learning the exact same things that mm -hmm. we're learning f many years ago. Uh, and going through the same troubles, but there's more information that has been shared for those individuals, which is mm -hmm. good for them, because uh, we've already been through that pain. So mm -hmm. if they were to read our information, they can subdue some of that pain. Um, but um, information, meaning metadata and knowledge and data and all that fun stuff is not uh, decreasing in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So uh, without using the uh, the, the feared term big data uh, too much, um, which doesn't mean anything. It's just uh, the lack of filtering. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, it's gonna, we're only accumulating files, right? Mm -hmm. it, and we're only accumulating digital files. So our, uh, we have plenty to do, and that's not gonna decrease mm -hmm. anytime soon. So uh, I'll, I'll ask the same sort of question in, in a different way. Um, but what do you want to be talking about in a few years? What, what, are, what are the things, and what do you think people should be talking about over the next two to three years? You can, you can totally call me out if that's like, if that's the exact same question. No, I, I mean, it is to a degree, but uh, it, it's about being able to mature your team if you have a team of people. It sometimes it's a team just of one. team in general, yeah. just having a team. Right? Yes, yeah, it'd be kind of helpful to have people managing your dam. Um, because the, the part-timer rarely works. Um, the uh, Let's just add it to your uh, things to do uh, because you're a designer and you really, really want to use a dam all day long. Um, oh, I, that's not what they sign up for. Um, uh, and same thing with photographers, surprise, surprise. Um, I used to be one. Um, that's how I got into dam uh, personally because I was able to and I wanted to find my photos again and my colleagues didn't. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was like, hmm, there's a job opportunity here. Uh, do stuff that nobody else wants to do and do it well. Um, so there is a future there. Um, so there'll, there'll be plenty more of that to do. And um, it's going to be less about the technology that you pick because let's just pretend it's going to continue working well together. At least you'll pick, it, you'll choose your technology correctly and smartly rather than... Um, looking at the pretty ones mm -hmm. um, and hoping and praying that they work together. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, back to the information, you know, uh, and the processes that, because it starts with people and then they come up with processes even well before they have dam. And that's still the same case as it's continuing to happen. And then they invite technology to enable them, right? Rather than people conforming to technology uh, which still happens on occasion, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a lot to add to that. That's really pretty good. Um, you know, I, I think it's just about where at the pro, where, where in the planning and in the, where at the table are you sitting, so to speak. You know, I think that too often than not in the past, the archive, the library has been the back end. It's sort of at the end of the process. You know, someone's created something and they've finished it and they've toiled over it and then six months later, their desk is a mess and someone says, you should really put that in the, put that away somewhere and move on to the next thing. And they just sort of go and they put it in a box and someone deals with it after the fact and recreates or re-engineers what, what was done organically over some time by a creative. I think that has to change. I think that's the sort of, you know, conversation to have is how does that process become part of the process further upstream? Um, that's certainly something I've had a lot of, spent a lot of energies on in various um, environments is, is, is advocating for, I don't want to, I don't want to get your garbage after, be it digital or physical or both. I want to, I want to help you figure out from the very beginning what it is and know that at the end of the process, I can tell you what I want and what you can throw away. Um, and again, physical or digital doesn't matter. Um, so I think perhaps what maybe is the next thing to come mm -hmm. as we brainstorm here is, is how does this process move closer to the start of the process um, and gain the respect it needs to have that seat yeah. at the table to be more of, of, of that planning up front rather than an afterthought after the, the, the dust is settled. I think that's a really interesting point because because what it, what it does point to is sort of a, a, a specialization of roles. Mm -hmm. 
you know, within an organization where it's, you know, you're not, you know, it's not just administrator up on high who's kind of sitting in a reactive role, but more of a proactive role where maybe, okay, you have a team, maybe there's a team and there's sort of like the forward person mm -hmm. who kind of gets out and does that sort of like, does the, does the, <clears throat> sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, my library is going to show here, but to the sort of reference interviews mm -hmm. um, where you're pulling, where, where you're really trying to find out where the stuff is, what it is, and how you pull it in, you know, the sort of metadata specialties and the sort of uh, channel specific roles, maybe, you know, video, uh, you know, kind of standard assets, audio, whatever, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think it's true, and I think that the challenge is always how do I make steps further into the start of the process that aren't odorous to the point where someone has any valid reason to not do it? How can I make it so painless that they um, are exposing themselves as you know, being difficult if they don't just click that button when they're supposed mm -hmm. to click it, because it's no big deal. Um, and then that just has an enormous benefit you know, as you move downstream. So um, it, it's really that. I think about that a lot. And I think about that in connection with technology. And I was talking to, to you a few minutes ago about, you know, how I love to autom use metadata to automate process. And mm -hmm. it, it ties in with that, that, you know, not only do I, I, I want that process, that whatever that is, that verb action, to, to get you to do something that that's enormously valuable to me and easier than that it'll ever be two weeks later, um, how do I get you to do that? Or how do I get it so that the minute you do something else, it's indicating that it should happen anyway behind the scenes without you needing to do anything? Um, so I think that's where things are starting to go. Automation based on data, based on process, um, and sort of you know connecting all the dots so that the ship tightens. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, it's good. No. Uh, all good points. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot more uh, crowd sourcing and uh, of metadata sometimes, but it still comes down to uh, do they have enough information to know what content is in there? Because if, if, if it requires any institutional knowledge, the, mm -hmm. the chance that somebody in uh, anywhere offshore knows what mm -hmm. is inside your organization is very low. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but it, it, even the fact of adding or the, the concept of adding metadata to your assets is not 100% there yet. Uh, which is uh, frightening uh, to many organizations uh, that still don't realize it. Um, because it's not garbage in, garbage out. It's garbage in, garbage stay in. Mm -hmm. And most people don't realize that, that you shove it in there and then you can't find it and you just well, accumulate more. There's two problems. Please. There's two There's two problems happening at the same Please. time. There's, 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 there's the fact that metadata is not, is, is still not part of the workflow. Mm -hmm at the same time growing at the same rate, if not bigger, as a master data management problem. Mm -hmm. sure. is, is not having not having very strongly defined taxonomies, mm -hmm. uh, just just one set of truth through everything. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I think I think that's something in the next in the next five years you're going to see that sort of like dam and master data management really come together. I hope so. Uh, it has to. It has I agree. To because because I, I don't think you're going to have a lot. You're you're going to run into sort of a babel situation where where people are not going. You're you're going to build large systems where people aren't able to find anything, which mm -hmm. is something we've been dealing with the whole time. Mm -hmm. you know, because before it was just we were building small systems that <laughs> nobody could find <laughs> find anything, and now they're going to. They're, that's going to scale as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think. At least for me, I feel like that is a huge yeah. point. Yeah, it accumulates in not finding more that you want mm -hmm. to find. Uh, to, no, I totally agree. And, and it, I hope it, it, it goes that way. But um, you have to, organizations have to realize that it, uh, you know, adding that information on there is an investment because mm -hmm. you add it once and you can find it a thousand times over. If it's, you can filter down and narrow down your search mm -hmm. enough and find it within seconds or minutes rather than hours or not at all. Uh, there was like some Fortune 500 company that supposedly took 
thir no, 10 people 30 hours to find one file, mm -hmm. uh, and that's acceptable in what realm? Anyone? I didn't, everybody, I didn't got, think, I every, didn't, everybody got paid. Uh, oh, oh, right, right. Oh, yeah. oh, that, it wasn't is fun. that the ultimate goal? It, it wasn't fun. <laughs> it wasn't fun, but, uh, you know, uh, like, they still got a paycheck at the end of two uh, weeks. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, if, that, if that's the goal, then, yeah, then, yeah. then it'll continue happening, right? And, you know, the CFO probably fell over and died. But that's okay. <laughs> that's yeah. why they replaced him, right? Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, I guess this is a good time to ask if anybody's got questions out in the audience. And we'll repeat and them. I will be happy to hand you a microphone. Uh, if it stretches that far. Can we stretch that far? Uh, no, we might have luck. Okay. Stand and be cool and stuff too. Um, so I work as an information architect now for a company and I work in the corporate archives section. Um, corporate archives exist. Now one of the things that we're experiencing is that as we're trying to standardize uh, our objects and our metadata and all that stuff, frequently we get consulted by other parts of the department, other departments. So our, our role is actually becoming what you guys were saying, whereas you know we're not just getting people's garbage now, we're sort of like, we are Assist, a faci assisting in the facilitation of the garbage <laughs> pre is sort of like the pre-sorting which is really great which is actually one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot as someone who's you know been going through this officially and unofficially for the last 10 years um, I think part of the conversation is actually really about how to incorporate the the workflow into the daily life mm -hmm. of an employee at, or a consultant or a freelancer um, if more than anything, um, because I think the the, co the you know the vendor conversation is there. It's always going to be there. You're always, which is great that you're vendor neutral. But um, so my question being, uh, back to the workflow about how how how, how do you um, how do you remain persistent mm -hmm. in implementing those workflows? at the sort of granular employee level because a lot of people are just very lazy and would rather not do that thing that they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. In any other case uh, where you have an employee company scenario, that's insubordination and cause for firing. <laughs> but in our case, it's like, well, I don't have time or mm -hmm. I just don't want to do it. Or so. it's not part of my job description. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've heard that before. I almost want to retract where they used a few minutes ago, but it is, it is sifting for buried treasure. Um, and for buried treasure that you don't know you're going to need until sometime in the future. So it's a bit of an art form. Um, I can be very persistent. <laughs> and, you know, it's about choosing your battles and, and kind of trying to find small things. And so instead of, I've often been successful by saying, we want to get from here to way over there. But we're not going to have that conversation. I only want to go from here to here. Mm -hmm. Let's do that first and see if it works. And if everyone's sort of comfortable with it, then I'll do another one and another one. And, and the next thing you know, we've got it. We've gotten where we want to go. Um, but it's really about sort of timing and persistence. I've had a number of instances where over the years, I've had some idea that I thought was the right thing to do. And um, everyone sort of would go, yeah, we should do that. But no one ever did. And, Every opportunity I had that was appropriate to bring it up and remind them that that was an idea that would have solved that problem too, I did. Um, and then when there was a moment, um, or if there's a moment where it's obviously the right time to say it, new guy, new boss, or reorg, or some new organization change, or, or some new budget, or whatever, then I would pounce and say, now's the time. Now we should yeah. do it. And, and let's make this happen, because it's the right thing to do. And you're going to save in these other ways. So you want to be able to connect the dots to not only you need to do this because it's the right thing to do, but the value for you is in this and this and this and this. And you know, I hate to say it, because, it, but it's the reality. So people get repurposed and people get people's jobs changed. So you know, it may be, well, that you have ten people on your payroll now in that department. Maybe that that tenth one could be working for Joe over there because he needs help with something else. But you might only need nine, and that's going to reduce your budget load into your you know, direct report, and that's always a good motivator. But persistence, don't let it drop. If you're convinced it's the right thing to do and it makes sense, eat away at it and just wait for the right moment, and don't get fired. 
<laughs> yeah, I would agree with that as well as um, there has to be accountability in the organization because it, if you don't have accountability, you're not going to get anywhere. And that comes from the top or it should um, because accountability of one, you can try to f inflict accountability. It doesn't work very well. It's kind of hard. Uh, tried it. Um, so if there's no accountability in the organization, it's a very much of an uphill battle pushing boulders up as well. Um, and then it's starting with the process that they have today. And like, so how do you request or acquire uh, this thing or create this thing? And capturing that information of, well, who requested it and what did they exactly request in writing, hopefully? And can we capture that in some kind of form and make that into metadata? So starting from request for a asset and who requested it and the budget and what's the contents of that asset. If you can start from that very beginning, hypothetically, from the concept idea and to the request all the way across to the actual creation and production of that asset or acquisition of that asset, including the licensing, if possible, in a perfect world, uh, capturing that so that you can, oh, legally use an asset again or the first time which would be really helpful um, to avoid uh, litigation and other legal issues that is sometimes a reason to get a dam, uh, to minimize the legal aspects yeah. of, uh, oops, I, I misused an asset and that cost us a lot of money repeatedly. Yeah, break, 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 it, you know, break it out in terms of like, who's, who, who's gonna be really concerned with that? That's gonna be like your legal department, your art buyers, you know, it's like project managers probably want the files to show up on time, Marketers probably want everything. Creatives want to be left alone. But, but you know, I think Hein Heinrich made a really good point. And I wanted to add to it is that it's you got to make a business case, and the business case may be um, it may be some combination of things. It may not be one thing, but it can. There's a huge business case to be made on the rights management side of it. You can't afford the liability of having it in some form because too many people are going to be able to get access to it, or it'll be all it's going to take is one. Uh, inappropriate or unlicensed use of that mm -hmm. um, document or that that image or that video, and whatever you're going to pay in legal and yeah. um, in, in in law fees to resolve that problem is going to be a fraction. It'll be a co it'll cost a fraction of that to just solve this the right way, so we avoid it. Um, so it's about making the connection to the business case. It's about sort of showing the the benefit, the global benefit throughout to to making those steps, and then making them as painless for everyone as possible. More questions? Yes. All right, I got a question for you guys. Um, so the dam industry started years and years ago, but a lot of things have changed uh, in the world, especially with a lot of companies, even like Google or all these tech companies that have grown and developed new ways that people look at technology and new ways that people um, look at data. And what I wanted to know was, what can the dam industry learn from some of these n newer companies? And what has it learned? And what does it really still need to learn? Uh, there's plenty that it needs to learn. Um, Agile would be helpful too. Um, moving, moving in the agile method rather than um, snail's pace. Um, but that, that's sometimes down to how much staff they have to actually develop their technology and adapt to the latest and greatest uh, or the, the usable uh, and acceptable terms of using technology uh, and user experience and things like that. So user experience is one of them. That's uh, one major thing that uh, a lot of damn vendors could uh, get a lot of a big dose of it, uh, depending on the vendor, which I still want to name names, uh, but uh, they know who they are. Um, and <laughs> or they'll figure it out eventually <laughs> as their clients disappear. Um, but <laughs> they, um, uh, aside from user experience, there's the, the aspect of um, um, transparency, of uh, being actually user-friendly. That'd be kind of helpful too. Um, uh, and there's so much else that is 
can't top, think of, yeah. Well, I think, I think the only one that matters is, is, is being user friendly. I think that you could have the best technology, but if someone sits down and doesn't know in 10 seconds how to use it and doesn't have an instant gratification to find something, you've lost them. Um, so to your point, I think the Googles of the world and the Yahoo's, you know, you want one big search screen that someone could find something quickly without a lot of training. Um, you're going to want to train people for advanced usage, but you want people to at least sit down and go, oh, I get this. I don't need to read a manual. It's, it's innate. That's the challenge. And, and it's a big turn off. Even for me, I, I just don't, I, I don't like sitting down and seeing complicated screens. Yeah. You know, I'd rather sit down. And, I'm going to innately embrace a technology, even if it's not as good, because I'm going to have a better user experience um, than perhaps reach the same point with another technology, but it's going to be a slower process because I'm going to have to understand how I'm navigating and what I'm seeing and all the different sort of icons, and it may not be intuitive. Um, the other thing is clicks. You know, I, have a, I work with a system, which I won't name, um, but it takes about eight clicks to get anything done. And, and I wrote a, a, a Martin Luther-like tome to, <laughs> to the person who ran the system <laughs> Saying that you you know I get it and I understand why you like it, but let me tell you what I think. And it was very polite. It was just basically like, here's some of the logic that seems kind of odd about this. Um, do with it as you please. Uh, and they have to some degree, but but you know it's about instant gratification. Someone sitting down quickly to find something. I want to sit down and it's be innate, and I want to not have to click too many buttons to get to it. That's yeah. what I think we all have to learn from that. I think I think a related thing is like you know you you know if you're working with the right people, either a vendor or a team, when you're talking about when you're talking about incorporating aspects of the really good sites, the really good vendors, you know, Google and Amazon and Facebook and Twitter and everybody. If you're kind of talking about trying to like pull in some of that experience, then you're then you're with the right people. If you if the, but if it's just you're just focused on like what's in front of you, then that's, that's you want to run away. Right, I, and, I, and I want to just qualify that there's a time, there's a right place for complexity, but if you're trying to provide a tool for broad use across a big organization, that may not be the right place for it. And it might be that different rights and permission management gives you the ability to, to manage the complexity specific to each department's need. Um, or give them just the ability to customize their screens and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, but at the sort of broad level, you want it to be obvious. More questions? Oh. Uh, two quick questions. One is in terms of convergence. So with 177 current vendors, I guess, on the list, uh, broadcast advertising. There's been a lot of you know going to single single voices. Do you think uh, dam space is is shrinking or expanding? And second, completely unrelated question is transparency on on the flip side. So there's the vendor side, on the customer or the RFP side, etc. So in terms of sharing best practices, online glossary, everything else. So do you think that's that's getting better on the customer side in, in terms of managing expectations and clearly stating them? Separate questions, sorry. So uh, I'm sorry. The the first one was the first one was uh, was about the uh, the amount oh. the amount of damn vendors. Oh, yeah, it's not going down. Yeah, it's, it's literally increasing every month. Uh, I've been watching it. Uh, it's you can add one or two well, every month. Well, we've been through this once before. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you go back to like nine, ten years ago, and and there were a lot more vendors, and they plunged. You yeah. know, it was sort yeah. of like an extinction level event. And <laughs> yeah. It's gone back up again. Yeah, right, so right. it's like, is that, is that, you know, is, are they, is there, is there going to be another event like that? Mm -hmm. You know, is there going to be more consolidation, mm -hmm. or you know, or is it just a bigger market and there's enough room for everybody to play? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a lot of it is based on how well they're marketed, um, whether they're good or not. Um, but there, yes, there will be other dips, uh, and some of those dips were financial, like they literally went bankrupt, uh, or they cooked their books, or they, uh, yeah, that too, or, um, they, yeah, yeah, we won't go into the which ones cooked their books, but, uh, um, they know who they are too. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, 
and supposedly those are getting better um, after they cooked their books and got bought out by somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, happens all over in tech. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, if, if that if that improves it, so be it. Um, so so yes, there'll be some consolidation. There'll be some buyouts. There'll be some mergers. Um, so yes, it will dip uh, and and. Uh, and then as far as back to the second part of your question, uh, transparency. So the, there's more to be done and transparency has to happen across both sides of the, the table. Um, the expectations have to be clear, true and, uh, and transparent as well, because, uh, often they're not from the client. So they're expecting that uh, they'll buy the solution and it's a silver bullet and uh, it'll auto magically uh, apply metadata to every single asset, which is furthest from the truth, no matter what system you get. Um, it, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It takes a lot of work. The, it, it, the work ain't going to get done unless a human actually still does it, um, no matter what technology you buy. There is no technology to this day that catalogs your assets for you, uh, no matter what they lie to you. Um, and that'll continue happening. Uh, so people don't think about that part. They just think, oh, well, I, I need a dam because I need to reduce liability, or I need a dam because I'm accumulating more assets and I need to kind of sort of find them for some reason. Uh, even though th there's three parts of the equation, there's the business side that tries to make the business decisions based on the case studies and things like that. And they understand the hypothetically the value, how much they're spending, and how much they're allegedly getting back, maybe. Um, and then there's the creative side, which wants to do anything and everything with as much as possible for as long as possible, and then eventually they get a deadline. And then there's the technical side. And they have their own requirements that they try to help the other two groups with the business and creative side, um, but they don't get requirements nor feedback. And then they don't, neither of the three sides talk to each other enough. Uh, so the transparency has to happen internally first, and the homework has to be done internally to the organization that wants a dam well before they get a dam, well before they shop for a dam, and then go seek vendors. And that's some of the stuff that I tell people. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I think that, you know, I think in general the transparency has gotten better over the last few years. I think there's more of it. Um, I think that as a rule of thumb, if you don't sense that you're getting the full picture from the vendor or consultant you're working with, and they're the wrong ones, um, a good consultant, a good vendor will, will be blunt at some point because they don't want to own the liability or the nightmare that they're going to be part of if they're not. So um, I think there's more of it, and there is more of it now than there has been in the past. I think people were a little more eager to sell products in the past and sort of figure it out after the fact. Um, and I think people are starting to ask the right questions and be a little smarter about how they go about it. And this is my take. If they don't want a shelf baby. Well, if they don't want to spend twice as much after fixing it. That too. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I'm, thanks very much. Thanks to Thank Eric. You. Thanks to thanks to Phil. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>